Let me extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you who are here on site with us and those who have joined us online. And uh, this exciting day indeed. Why? Every time we come together, together as a congregation, it is an exciting time. Because when two or three are gathered in His name, the Word of God reminds us, God is there with us. Somebody shout aloud, Amen. 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 Before I turn to God's Word today, as I was preparing for the sermon today, God reminded me of something. And it was then that it reminded me of a statue. And I have a picture of it here. Have you all seen this? Yeah, this statue was installed in the visitor's lobby of the United Nations building. Yeah, in 2021. It was a donation from the government of Mexico done by a Mexican artist. And you may ask the question, why put such a hideous statue right in such public display? If you look at the statue, you may not understand. But if you read Daniel chapter 7, verse 2 and 4, or Revelation 13, verse 2, I'm not going to read it, but enough for you to, you can go back, take time to read it. Daniel chapter 7, verses 2 to 4 to and Revelation chapter 13, verse 2, that this actual statue is what was spoken about in the Bible. But what's it got to do with it being installed there? This picture, this statue, as a significance of emergence of the times. Jesus wants us to be not only aware of the signs, but to be aware of the times of the signs. Do you know that the Bible in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 46 reminds us that there is a spiritual dimension, there is a natural dimension. But what comes first is not the spiritual, but the natural. When you see things in a natural happening, there is a move in the spiritual. This statue symbolizes the beast that's talked about emerging in the final days. Do you know God is wanting to us to catch our attention to, for us to be alive and alert to understand and because the problem today is that we are so caught up with our life, caught up with urbanization, with all the struggles. Yes, there is tribulation in the nations. When you're living in the world, the Bible says very clearly, Jesus said it himself, in this world you will have tribulations. And the problems of the world which are upon you will distract you from your destiny and your mission. But God is not leaving us without warning us. You'll find it in Luke chapter 21, as I was preparing. Verses 25 to 28 is not up there, but just go back and read it. Luke chapter 21, verse 25 to 28. And Jesus said, And there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars and upon the earth. Now, if you go back and look at this, I don't know how many of you are aware, last week we had an eclipse. Were you one of those that went and bought special glasses to go and look? What happened was, what happened last week was not just an eclipse, but a hybrid eclipse. A hybrid eclipse is very rare. It will last happen in 2013. The next time it happened, you'll be in 2031. Not a coincidence, huh? Last time it happened was 2013. And the next one will be 2031. And in this 21st century, 
They tell us there will be seven such eclipses in this 21st century, which is 100 years. Seven is a perfect number of the Lord. You see, I believe God works to catch our attention and nothing happens by accident. Nothing happens by accident. And I'm sharing this not because it's part of my sermon, but I felt God says, release this as a prelude to a sermon. Catch people's attention. That there's an urgency of the time and there's an urgency for the people of covenant vision to open your ears and hear. To open eyes and begin to see. And prepare your hearts because we are in the final days, not for the end of the world, but we're going to see the soon and coming return of our King. Amen? Amen. Let's quiet the hearts down. Father, we thank you, Lord. We know we are in that natural, waiting to see a move of your supernatural. But yet we are so caught up, Father. Caught up in the things of the world that we have lost sight of the final destiny and the plans that you have for us. But this morning as we sit before you in your presence, let your presence be manifested in our midst, Lord. Let your presence just sweep over this whole place and over everyone that's listening online. Let us be people that have ears that will hear. Let us not be dull, yes, in our hearing, but let us be alive. And we give thanks and give praise that in all things, Lord, you be lifted high. In all things, the name of Jesus alone be magnified and glorified. In all things, Lord, I ask that you increase and I decrease before you. And we give you thanks, we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You know, the word reminds us of Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. God says, I know, I know. He has plans that are good and not evil. <coughs> plans that will give you hope and a future. But let's do a reality check right now. As a pastor, we deal with a lot of people that come to me with issues, whether these are problems in finances, problems in relationships, problems in physical health, problems in emotional health, problems even in relationships. And a reality check is that many of us don't see a hope in the future. Many of us are not able to rise up. The word in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 14 tells us that God has called us to be the head and not the tail, to be above and not beneath. Yeah. Romans 8, 27, Paul reminds us himself that we are to be not just conquerors, but more than conquerors. But that is a hard truth. And the hard truth is that many of us face daily challenges. And not only daily ch challenges, many of us are failing in the fight against daily temptations. But of course, the Bible tells us that we have God's truth. Is that not true? We have God's truth. We are living in a very privileged place in Singapore. There are places when people can't even get hold of one copy of the Bible. But if you go to most Christians' home today, who well, are not only one copy, sometimes two, three, four, different versions. And I see they're all lined up with the shelves. To know, to know and believe in truth. Reality 
that's not enough. You see, the truth is not just to be believed in and for you and I to know about it. One of the biggest issues today is that we are not living God's truth. John chapter 8, verse 31 to 32 reminds us of this. You see, did Jesus didn't just say, you know the truth and the truth will set you free. Jesus actually was speaking to believers. He said to the Jews that believe in him, only if you would live my word, yeah. then are you my disciples. How many of you would declare yourself as disciples of Jesus Christ? It's not about believing, it's not about knowing. Many of us know and believe. But the biggest challenge is, are you living the Word? Because if we live the Word, God's truth tells us it should set you free. But I realize a problem. And then one of the fundamental problems is that we become very selective of truth. Can I just have that flip cross? We become very selective of truth. And you see that even in the time of Jesus, Pontius Pilate was faced with having to make a decision. And so he asked Jesus, what is truth? What is truth? The truth to Pontius Pilate was the realities that face him and a certain decision he had to make. He knew Jesus was innocent. But yet there were consequences if he acted on what he believed. Another issue in the church today, and sorry, but I've got to say this very hard. We are selective of truth. We tend to cherry pick what suits us. We take this Bible, wow, there's so many things. Huh? But I like this one there. Eh? And it becomes like a cherry that you pick up and say, hmm. The other problem is that we measure what I call on a lopsided gospel. We become very heavy on God's forgiveness. Can I just have the next slide? Very heavy on grace and on mercy. But you know what's the most fundamental problem today in the church? We're not dealing with sin. Yeah. Do you know Jesus paid the price? Not just for your sins to be forgiven. The Word of God tells us He paid the price for remission. Not only just for forgiveness, but as far as the east is from the west, your sins have all been remitted. A heavy price he paid. A price shed in blood almost 2,000 years ago. A price that had to bridge because God cannot tolerate sin. Even for that moment as Jesus hung on the cross, he felt so alone because the sins of the world rested upon him. In agony, he says, Father, why have you forsaken me? God did not forsake Jesus. But for a moment when the sins of the world are upon God, his shoulders, the Father had to turn away. Sin is what separates us from God. But the sad thing in the church is that many of us have been forgiven, had, been, had our sins remitted, and all sins forgiven, not only your past, not only the present, but even every future sin that you may commit. 
But the problem is we still make a practice of sitting. The practice of sinning. First John 3, 8 tells us, and this is very clear, he that committeth sin is of the devil. I mean, the word of God doesn't mince anything. The apostle John said clearly, when you commit sin, you are of the devil. Now, I'm not here to condemn anybody. But are you still sinning? Where we're living in a world today, and the world has not been redeemed yet. And we know everywhere we go and everywhere we turn, even our eyes and our ears, sin exists. The Bible says the devil sinneth from the beginning. And the purpose of Jesus Christ, Son of God, being manifested. John 1.14 tells us, He was the Word, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We beheld But the purpose of his manifestation, the Apostle John said, is what? That he might destroy the works of the devil. I want you to hear this. Jesus did not only come to bring remission. Jesus did not only come to bring redemption. Jesus did not come to bring just reconciliation, that you can be reconciled with God. But Jesus came to destroy the very works of the enemy. But yet the reality, when we live in this world, we still see the works of sin. There's still sickness. There's still disease. There's still strife. There's still pornography. There's still lust. There's still many things that happen in the world today. Is the word of God not true? Does the word of God not work? You know, as I deliberate on this, the first thing that God put my heart again, go back and look at Matthew chapter 7. After the salvation, deliverance that was coming with Jesus' death, there were some warnings. In Matthew 7, tells us something. Enter ye at the straight gate. You see, there were two gates talked about by Jesus. There is a straight gate. But there's a wide gate. <laughs> the straight gate is narrow. In the white gate, there's a broad way. I'm not talking about a food center. <laughs> he talks about broad way. And that broad way, the easy way, leads to destruction. And the sad truth, Jesus said, and many there be which go in therein. Are you going into the Broadway? You see, we cherry pick gospel because the full challenge of salvation has not been made real in our lives. We know Jesus loves us. We know He paid the price. We know He did it all. We know He has finished it all. But salvation requires your response. There is straight, narrow. There is wide and broad. You see, the narrow is the way, Jesus said, that leadeth unto life. 
Did not Jesus come to give life and life more abundantly? Yes. And yet Jesus said, and few there be that find it. I thought salvation was so easy. I thought we had to say was sinner's prayer. And we are destined to go to heaven in a sweet by and by. I'm sorry. If you have been taught that, you may be disappointed one day when you stand before Jesus in the final day and He says, depart from me, I know you not. No, I'm serious. This is not my word. This is the word of the Bible. It's not just enough to accept Jesus. It's not just enough to believe in Him. It's not just, just enough to say, I trust in Him. But when the rubber hits the road, what is the reality are you facing? Why are you still, still having all the struggles? Now, I'm not saying no, because Jesus just said, when you are in the world, you will have tribulation. Why? Let's try and understand something. Today, if you've got your Bibles, I want you to keep your finger on Judges. Very good book to read. A time of Judges, where everybody did what they thought was right in their own sight. We're looking at Judges chapter 16. And I want to pull apart something that I'll call the, the anatomy of temptation. And we see this in the life of a man called Samson. Samson is like us. His mother was a Nazarite. She also committed him to be a Nazarite. So he was consecrated almost like a priest. And as a right, had certain things. He could not live a life that every normal person in the world. And as a right, for example, made a vow and he had to make certain commitments like not drinking liquor, not behaving like the people of the world. So here we see this story. He's like a, us. Do you know when you become a Christian? The Bible not only calls you a chosen generation. The Bible calls you to be a royal priesthood. The Bible calls for you to be a holy nation. Second Peter, the Bible calls you to be a peculiar people who must show forth the praises of Him who have called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Which means, if you are a true believer of Jesus Christ, there must be a difference that the world can see you. And the world say, he's a peculiar person. He's a weird person. He doesn't conform to us. Do you know that's why the world judges Christians so harshly? Because Christianity calls for you to carry a standard and that standard is what God calls us to do. In Romans chapter nine, uh, 8, verse 29, he says, For those he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. When you are saved, you have a destiny. And the foremost manifestation of your destiny is that you will be like Jesus. And when you are like Jesus, there's no other religion that attracts so much attacks. I'm not going to go into that, but that's a reality. But even though you're safe, we start with the life of Samson. You see, lust is always there. 
sin comes with the lust of the flesh. But we see Judges 16 verse 1. It all begins with a Nazarite who gives in to lust. In Judges 16, 1, he says, Samson went down to Gaza. And there he saw a prostitute. And what did he do? One time only. And he gave in and went into her. But you see, it starts with giving in. That's always the first step. In our Christian work, also we take baby steps. But unfortunately, in our sinning life, we still take baby steps. <laughs> and it begins when we take that baby step to walk to the wide gate. But do you know something? When you take the step towards that white gate, the gate opens for you. Everything will beckon to you to walk into the broad way. But I tell you this, a bait also needs to be baited. If you've gone fishing, you know, you take a hook, you've got to bait your hook before you throw your hook in. Right? You don't take a hook and throw it in and hope the fish will hook itself. A hook has to be baited. So we see this in the case of Samson. After the entry into giving into his lust, next thing the Bible says in verse 4, and it came to pass. The last when released. And he saw a woman. <laughs> and the scene is set. Do you know that our action is very important? How many of you read the story of Cain and Abel? It is the steps and what do, things do we do? Cain and Abel were given the same instructions by God. One was faithful. The other followed but was found unfaithful. He was upset with God. What did he do? And I'm killing his own brother. But I want you to see, if you've got your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. I don't have a, a slide for that. You know what? God said to him, to Cain, if you do well, if you do well, you see the big if there. If does not mean there's no hope. If there's a choice. If you do well, means he could have done well. Shall you not be accepted? Cain Abel, two brothers. That God says, if you do well. And then God gives a warning, if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. Some versions say, sin is crouching at the door. And what happens? You know, in that section of Scripture, it refers to sin as like a person. That sin is alive. Sin has a persona. It lies there. By your action, he can become your desire. 
And Genesis 4, 7, God warns this. Not only become your desire, it shall rule. Baby steps. You get baited. Bible warns us. We have been redeemed. We have been saved. But if you carry on sinning, when we got saved, our DNA is supposed to change. Our personality is supposed to change. Our everything is supposed to change. But it's still unforgiveness. It's still anger. It's still all the things of the flesh still manifesting in your life. Are you still only have one thing in your life? It's about me, mine, and what's mine. Many of us are still like that. And sin is crouching at the door. Sin wants to to be the primary desire in your life. And sin will rule over your life. But as I said, sin needs to be baited. Primary important. The bait will come with enticement. Now, those who are fishermen, you know, you don't just bang any bait and throw in. Well, we all take great preparation of bait, very important. Because bait must be enticing. The fish doesn't take your bait just because there's a bait, you know. Bait must entice. And see, the enticement is for one purpose. And you read on Judges chapter 16, verse 4 and 5, and that purpose is to get to the source of your strength. The Philistines tell Delilah, find out what's the source of your strength. What was it that gave him the stroke? It's not by might. It's not by power. As a New Testament Christian understand, it's by the Holy Spirit. And the devil wants to find a way that he can rob you of your strength. The devil wants to weaken the very source of strength. Remember, if you are a believer today, Paul already says, no, you're not. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus promised that not only he will abide with us, but He dwell with us and in us. John 14. The Holy Spirit wants to be in bed with you. He wants not to visit you when you're ready for Him. He wants to be in bed with you. He wants to use you as a habitation Hello. He wants to be the source of strength in you. But see, Holy Spirit is God. God gave you free choice. God gave you free will. And God will be unrighteous if He takes away your choice and free will. So you see this in Ephesians 3.20. Now unto Him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, even above all we can ask imagine. Now unto who? God. Unto who? Holy Spirit. Able to do exceedingly abundantly. But Ephesians 3.20 didn't stop there. It says, it's according to the power that is at work in your life. You see, the source of strength must be a power that works in your life. Life. There's power not only in the Holy Spirit in you, 
There's power in your decisions. There's power in your choices. There's a power that brings you into faith. Hebrews 11, 6 says, Without faith, you cannot please God. But he that comes to God must deal with something. God must be he is in your life. It's not enough to know God. But have you allowed to be he is in your life? Do you really know, Hebrews eleven six 6 says, that he is a rewarder that diligently, if you diligently seek him, But the devil wants to get in bed with you too. Sin wants to get in bed with you too. And you see that happening in Judges chapter 16. You see, Delilah was not just wanting to tempt and entice. Enticement required her getting in bed with him. So you see in 6 and 7, he, she began to cuddle, cuddle, huddle near to him. Look at the whole thing. Tell me, tell me. What is the source of your good strength? Bait already, the hook already baited. How do you know to get near the fish for him to take the bait? You got to get close to the fish. And that's how sin gets close to you. Now the problem we have. He's a Naz- Nazarite, right? He's a man who's been brought up in the ways of God. He's supposed to be made commitments and vows to God. But the next point I have, not only sin wants to get in bed with you, you play a part. And the next verses, 8 to 9, begin to tell us, Samson begin to toil, toy with danger. You see, this is a problem. Have we come to the point to hate sin until we will not allow sin any room in our lives? You know, when I did this study, you see in this verses, Samson began to enjoy himself. Hmm. The bait is there, and he is nibbling, nibbling. <laughs> I bet you there were must have alarm bells setting off. But you know what's the problem with Samson? He's like you and I. Many of things, we are strong enough. Don't have to worry. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm still in control. <laughs> ah, sin is not so dangerous. Huh? After all, Christ has paid the price in His blood. Anytime I can be washed again by the blood. And you know, you don't fall into sin. You go in bit by bit. You see, this is the problem with sin. And next thing you understand is that sin is not easily deterred. In the story of Samson and Delilah, see, Delilah did not give up. She began to toy back with him. Oh, you have mocked me. You told me lies. Please tell me. Follow so a bit. <laughs> Understand, sin does not give up. You see, your strength must not come from yourself. Paul warns us in 2 Corinthians. If you've got a Bible, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 to 11.
it is in our weakness that God's strength is perfected. When we think we are strong, that's the problem. Many of us think that we are strong. Many of us think that we can deal with this, we can deal with that. We are still in control. We think we know better. We think that I've gone to theological school, I've gone to Bible school. I, yeah, i got so much information. How many know information is not salvation? Jesus said, only if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples. Only if you begin to live it out. Sin is so deceptive. Sin slowly corrupts. It slowly corrodes. It will slowly destroy. You see, the next problem we see in Samson. False confidence. <laughs> you see this in Judges as it went on. When we have that false confidence, how many know we're ready for the fall? Move very quickly, next thing that sin does. And we see this in Judges 15 and 17. Sin will go for your heart. Remember? He's crouching at the door. And now in his ego, in his pride, in his confidence, Samson reveals his Nazarite vow. Is it a strength or not because his hair was long? His hair was part of the vow. Nazarite say they will not shave. They will not cut the hair. There's no strength in the length of the hair. Some people will tell you, because his hair is long, that's why he's strong. No. So his hair is cut, he got weak. No. His cutting of the hair broke his Nazarite vow. You see, all of you who are saved, you have inheritance, you have a legacy. But the Bible warns that we can be like Esau. Did Esau have an inheritance? Did he have a birthright? And yet, for a morsel of meal, he sold his birthright to his younger brother. And later, when he searched for it, the Bible says, with a lot of tears. And yet the father says, son, sorry, I really give the blessing of the firstborn to your brother. Your vow to God is not just about dealing with sin. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus gives us the formula for everything you need. He said, look at the lilies, look at the birds. Look at the unbelievers, what do they seek? What do unbelievers seek? Yeah. You know, three C's. Cash, country club, on, right? Credit cards, everything. And you think because you've got money, you're strong. But Jesus in Matthew 6, 33 say, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all the things that the unbelievers seek will be given to you. You see, God didn't make the world to bless the unbelieving world. He made it to bless you. The psalmist could not understand he said, when I saw the wicked prosper, my heart was troubled. Until I entered the sanctuary of the Lord and I saw the final outcome. Are you seeing the final outcome? 
or you're seeing the circumstances of living in this world today. Let me say this. There are consequences of sin. Unrepented, repetitive sin can cause loss. You can lose your marriage if you carry on indulging in that porn habit. You can even lose your job if you de defraud your employer. Yeah, you defraud employer many ways. You can cheat on your time. You can chat to all the time. You don't commit and discharge your duties properly. You can lose everything. And I, as a lawyer, I know it. I had a very good client. He was very rich for everything else. And because he was so rich, he was led to go into speculating on a lot of things, rubber and everything. End up losing heavily. Then he got into drinking and tried to solve his problems by drinking. In the end, said, one day, and I can still remember because that night he was in despair, he came to my house to see me. He went home, he didn't want to go in the house. He slept in the car. He told his bodyguard and he told his driver, no, let me sleep in the car. Early hours of the morning, he was staying near the beach. He walked to the beach, took took out all his clothes and walked into the water and committed suicide. This is a real story. You see, death comes with sin. And when you lose everything, if the world value is your final destination. But you know, God is good. The story of Samson did not end there. Yes. Judges 16, 21, 22. It ended with Samson being blinded. Let me say this aloud. Because God so loved you, if you would not deal with the sin in your life, God will. For Samson, gorging out his eyes, the Philistines thought they had triumphed. But it was in blindness that Samson woke up and saw. You know what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 28, 29? Let me, let me quote. If your eyes cause you to stumble and sin. You know what Jesus said? It may sound so harsh. Pluck out your eye. <laughs> Pluck out your eye and throw it away. Now, he doesn't want you to do that, of course. But if you don't deal with things in your life, because God so loves you, He may cause circumstance situation to wake you up. I'm, I'm telling you. You see, the good news, Samson had to be blinded before he turned back to God. And Judges 16, 28 says, he began to call out to God. You see, God's discipline is to turn us from final, eternal destruction. In Proverbs 3, verse 11 to 20, let me try and quote this from memory. Proverbs says, do not despise the chastisement of the Lord. Let us not despise the chastisement of the Lord, nor distest, distest His correction. 
The Bible says to whom the Lord loves, He corrects. Just as a father, the son whom He loves. You see, chastisement is not punishment. There will be eternal judgment in the end. But the chastisement and the correction that God wants to bring in life is in this life. And sometimes can be quite painful. I have learned myself. God's discipline is never pleasant. Oops. But the purpose of God's discipline is to save you from destruction and death that sin will ultimately bring. Sometimes we think that with God's grace, we'll never fail of the grace of God. But yet the author Hebrews warn us that you can fail of the grace of God. And I want to close now with this word of Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13. Now you've got Bible, I really want you to turn to this, and this will be my concluding verse. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13. The author of Hebrews encourages us to do not forsake the assembling together. We try to get people to church not because we want you to be here in church. But the Word of God says, do not forsake the assembling together. And Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13 says, we assemble for a reason. We exhort each another daily. How many know we need encouragement daily? That's why it's so important, not just attending the church, but being in the right community of Christians. I'm not saying our church is the only community, sorry. I'm not saying that. But it's important because I get people who come along and, you know, the Bible warns us, Second Timothy chapter 3. This is a time now people got itchy ears. You know, it's itchy ears now. You want to hear what you want to hear. So go to his church. Oh yeah, this pastor, horrible, talk about sin, talk about my la, my la, my la. I better go to a church better down there. There they stroke me, grace, grace, grace. No. You need to be exhorted daily, the Bible says. Daily. And it talks about something in Hebrews chapter 3. Well, the day is still called day. Means that time of end. And the Bible, the verse did not close with that. Lest, lest you get hardened by the deceitfulness. Lest you get hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is deceptive. Sin will lull you. Sin will entice you. Sin will begin to draw you in. Little by little. Remember Hebrews chapter 3 verse 13. Today, now no condemnation. Is there anyone among us who can say we have not sinned? Well, the Apostle Paul admitted in Romans chapter 7. I have a problem, he says. The things I want to do, I do not do. The things I don't want to do, I do. He admitted that because why? Because he say, in this flesh dwells no good things. With the body they have, we still sin. That's why Paul says, wretched man am I. Who can save me from this body of sin? Wretched man, he said. But then he woke up. But Christ has already completed it all. 
In Romans chapter 8, verse 1, he says, Now, therefore, there's no more condemnation in Christ Jesus. The key word is in Christ Jesus. You may be a Christian for 20 years. You've been a Christian since the day you were born. That, but there will still be condemnation if you're not in Christ Jesus. And the Apostle Paul defines it. Who walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. You see, you still have to make a choice. You still have to make a decision. You don't kill this body. You need this body to live in this world. But Christ has done it all. He's paid the price. He's put the Holy Spirit in you, not only to strengthen you, not only to encourage you, not only to love you and comfort you, but the Holy Spirit in you wants to enable you. The Holy Spirit wants to bring gifts. The Holy Spirit wants to bring weapons of warfare. The devil doesn't want you to understand this. Do you know the 27 gifts in the Bible? I've done research, maybe more, but I found 27 gifts of the Holy Spirit. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. All the gifts are there in the Old Testament, except for two. Jesus came to bring two gifts in the New Testament, and they were tongues and interpretation of tongues. Do you know, tongues is a powerful weapon and the devil doesn't want you to understand it. People think tongues is just a language you cannot understand. No. Tongues can be a prayer. And in that unknown language, you speak like angels to God. Tongues can also be for encouragement. Encouragement personal, Jude 20. When you're feeling low, stir up your most holy faith by praying in the Holy Spirit. The devil doesn't like that. Do you know that even you're alone, you're feeling things, you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you can be just sitting there, discouragement come and you go korobahanda rebo, robahanda rebo, handa, and you stir up the whole most Holy Spirit within you. Faith begins to rise. This is personal edification. There's corporate edification. When you worship, somebody speaks in tongue. But that, you need interpretation. Because without interpretation, nobody understands. See, God doesn't want you to babble. But there is the prayer language. Romans 8, 26, when you know not how you ought to pray. When you are burdened, when in your natural mind, sin is still crouching at the door. Do you know as you begin to pray in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit takes over and divinely the Holy Spirit will lead and guide you, Romans 8, 26, to pray the perfect prayer that God is waiting for you. Don't let the devil deceive you. The devil li don't like you to pray in tongues. But how do you know? Wherever there's a truth, there is a counterfeit. I know, because I was very steep at one time, although I was born a Christian. I was sitting in temple committees. I used to tell people, I uh, what all this Holy Spirit, look, my tanki also all can speak in tongues. <laughs> it's true. But when I had knowledge and revelation and spirit of wisdom, I realized our weapons of warfare are not of this world, but mighty to God to the pulling down of strongholds. Yet, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. We are to cut down the imaginations. We are to cut down every high thing that, what? 
exalt itself above the knowledge of God. That sin, it can blind you. Your knowledge of God can become blinded. You see, God wants to bring every thought. I'm quoting from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 to 6. God wants to bring every thought, all the wrong thoughts, all the struggles into captivity and obedience unto Jesus Christ. And when that happens, you can then begin to judge your own disobedience. Amen? Let not we say, I have no more disobedience. I still struggle. Hello? Don't throw rocks at me. I still struggle. My eyes still cause me to sin. My ears still cause me to stumble. My actions causing other people to stumble. <laughs> yeah, don't look so sad. Lah. <laughs> but that's why we need to exhort each other daily. Amen. We need to encourage one another daily. Yes. We need to provoke each other daily. But it all begins today when you say, God, I want to come right now. I want to come with open arms. I want to come and say, Lord, I thank you for having saved me from sin. But Lord, help me not make sinning a practice in my life. It begins when you say, God, here I am. Here I am, Lord. If today you want to say this to God, the altars are open. This is between you and God. This is not accusing anybody of sin when they come forward. This is you say, God, here I am. Would you take me? Would you use me? Would you strengthen me? Would you protect me? Will you help me walk in this new natural life? So right now as a worship team would just minister to us the closing song. The altars are now open. I say the altars are now open. Between you and God right now. Come. And we have altar counselors that will pray with you. And I'll be there to pray with you as well. God bless you all.